have something delicious in front of you to eat while we're speaking together. This session will be all about spatial mapping and launching CRP's new Urban Logistics Hub webpage. This is an interactive mapping tool developed as a result of CRP's recently published study on the potential for urban logistics hubs in central London. We'll also be discussing how spatial mapping tools, techniques and analysis can help identify equity and distributional issues related to neighbourhood street interventions, that is, low traffic neighbourhoods. My name is Susanna Wilkes, Director here at Cross River Partnership, and over the next 45 minutes, we'll be sharing with you the results of the most recent research and analysis in both residential and commercial neighbourhoods, as well as new types of emerging mixed neighbourhoods. Before we make a start, a few bits of housekeeping I'd like to mention. This session is being recorded and will be available to view online. I know you'll be able to see that there's only one person watching with you, but I can assure you, you're definitely not alone. If you do have any difficulties seeing or hearing, please make sure you've joined us via the Google Chrome browser. We find this one definitely does work the best. You should have PowerPoint slide visuals and speaking voices throughout this session, both at the same time. Any problems at all, please try logging out and rejoining the session. I'm very pleased to introduce to you the experts who will be joining us today from across the industry. These include Dr. Rachel Aldred of the University of Westminster and Director of the Active Travel Academy. Laura Jacklin, Senior Project Officer at Cross River Partnership. Laura will launch CRP's new interactive mapping tool, which aims to increase the number of sustainable last mile deliveries in central London, in turn reducing air pollution, congestion and carbon emissions. The tool has been designed to support freight logistics companies who are actively searching to occupy a central London location and supports owners of sites looking to advertise their spaces to prospective freight companies. Rachel's recent research involves analysis of low traffic neighbourhoods in London in relation to neighbourhood and population characteristics, including age, disability, ethnicity, deprivation and car ownership, based on output areas of several hundred residents. Her research highlights how London-wide impacts may mask wide diversity by borough and the need to monitor such distributions at borough as well as at city level. We're also joined today by CRP's Anusha Rajamani, who will be moderating the chat facility on the right of your screens. And last but by no means least, we have CRP's Rachel Aldridge leading all of our tech for the session. That makes Rachel definitely the most important person here today on this call. Great, so what we're going to be covering today is all of these topics on your screen. There'll be a chance for you to have your pre-submitted questions answered at the end of each of the presentations. We'll try our very best to answer all your questions, but if we do run out of time, we'll respond to you after this live session. If you have any extra questions that you would like to ask our speakers about on spatial mapping and the benefits it can deliver for air quality, logistics and healthy streets, please type them into the chat box at any time. Also, what else do you think is needed to solve some of the challenges we're facing? Pose your questions and thoughts in the chat box to the right of your screens and remember to add your name and organisation too. I'd like to tell you a tiny bit of context before we delve into the details of space for sustainable logistics. Just in case any of you haven't heard of Cross River Partnership, we were formed 27 years ago to build bridges across the River Thames, including the Golden Jubilee footbridges. Our vision is to empower people to deliver innovative projects that support places to respond well to the challenges being thrust upon us. These are the values that CRP holds dear to everything that it does. All of the interventions that you'll hear about this afternoon are about enabling positive change 
useful collaborations to take place and lessons on sustainability in London to be shared between many different organisations in lots of different locations. By now, CLP is delivering London's future together with partners that include local authorities, business improvement districts, landowners, freight operators and many other agencies. We're committed to the value of partnership working in everything that we do. As highlighted in a recent Economist article, online retail typically needs three times as much space as physical retail. London has lost a lot of its industrial land. Put simply, developers are definitely struggling to meet demand for storage space. This needs to be supported in ways that are also good for physical, i.e. high street, retail. We need to make sure that warehouses, storage, logistics, consolidation and distribution sites are not forgotten, not overlooked, but are properly and creatively planned so that they can make an excellent contribution to thriving high streets. So in order to inspire us with CLP's latest online logistics mapping tool, it now gives me enormous pleasure to introduce my CLP colleague, Laura Jacklin. Hello everyone, thank you Susanna for that um, lovely introduction to CRP. So I'm going to talk today a little bit more about the tool that we will be launching. So just a bit of a background and history to um, the Urban Logistics Hubs map. Um, this was first looked at from the Central London Sub-Regional Transport Partnership, which is a group that um, CRP manages on behalf of TfL and 10 of the Central London boroughs as you can see on the right in the map and the group is there to facilitate studies and feasibility studies on anything to do with transport infrastructure or challenges that London faces so it's made up of the 10 as you can see and we were commissioned last year we commissioned steer uh, to do a study on potential urban logistics space and this came about because of the challenge as Susanna has mentioned about space in London being um, available for things like logistics and transport. So the study was done in 2020 last year we launched it in January at our first lunchtime launch in 2021 and we since then have decided to go on to our next phase which is to put some of the results that we got from that report to a web tool um, this the study is currently online anyway for everyone to look at it's quite a lengthy document looking at supply and demand for urban logistics hubs in central london uh, a range of stakeholders were interviewed both local authorities and operators and there was a created a template for criteria of what a hub would need. Um, 29 sites were identified through this study. Um, and we thank both every stakeholder who was involved in this um, process because it was quite lengthy and there was a lot of detail needed for the logistics plan. So a bit of description on the types of hubs that we're looking at. There are both the urban logistics hubs, which are a bit larger sites for urban areas for kind of more national supply chains by bigger operators and then last mile on electric bands. But we also looked at micro hubs for the kind of smaller operators that are in central London, including those delivering on cycle freight and using walking freight. And this is an important um, description to have because there are different types of hubs that could be utilised for different usage and also for what kind of fleets they would need to accommodate. Uh, in the study we did look at a lot of examples of best practice that are currently already happening um, throughout central London. I think most people have heard of uh, the Newt electric vehicle trial which looked at last mile um, on electric vehicles. There's also a lot of cargo bike suppliers across London um, with their own space and doing lots of dis distribution and consolidation work already. And an innovative approach uh, by for in consolidation by the Hospital Trust as well, by Guys and St. Thomas's. So there is a case study on that specific consolidation process on our website and all of the case studies were highlighted in the study. And some of the results of those um, studies showcased 
potential sites that could be used as, as hub space. And heat maps were provided to showcase the last mile that could be done from these hubs. So it really does show you the density and the remit that these deliveries could be made, whether it was on cycle or whether it was on EV. And it does show that there is potential space quite central in these areas that could be used um, by both micro hubs or just, uh, larger hubs. So as I said, there was quite a few st stakeholders that were involved in the study. We looked at both supply, so what kind current sites are available or what would be needed for a current site, any underutilized space. So this could be both car parks, railway arches, um, any kind of form of building that is currently not utilized to its full capacity and demand. So asking those in the industry, businesses and logistics operators on what they would actually need to have an urban logistics hub, what would be needed as space, access, infrastructure, because we wanted to make sure that both stakeholders gave their points of view. As I'm pleased to say, the 29 sites were identified. We are still in conversation with all of those areas, um, which were mostly central London areas of Westminster, Camden, Wandsworth, and some of the other boroughs in Celestrop. And we decided that the second phase would be a web tool to visualize these spaces that could be available. And so what we have done is we've now created a whole site that has these sites on there mapped out with some of the filtering that you can see on the right hand side. And this is supposed to help showcase in a visual way and a visual manner to all of those looking for sites, but also for boroughs to see what potential sites are already up and running. This is a launching as a free service. So this can be used by both operators and local authorities. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about how to use this tool. So we wanted to make sure that the functionality of the criteria from the template from the study was involved in this tool. So looking at the location where the site would be held, the amount of space that a site had, the access by HGV um, or the road network and any extra information that um, any site owner could provide. And on the right hand side, you can see a snapshot of what if you were to go into one to look at an area. This is a test site. This is what it would look like. You would have all of the descriptions on the left hand side, a street view available and a way to contact that site owner. On the right hand side, there is a map filter to, to filter between potentially micro sites or larger sites. Those who are potentially partly occupied at the moment. So it would be a multi occupancy site or those who are currently not occupied and looking for someone to take over. So these are the map filters. We're hoping to keep those kind of there. So it's a lot easier to look at what type of site you would want. And the next part is to get operators who are interested in potential sites to contact us through the site, um, to contact us through the contact page on the right. And then we will put, be putting the operator in contact with the site owner. We're also very interested to talk to any operators of different sectors, so construction or other sectors who have potentially different requirements um, rather than just a dry goods operator. So just to be clear, a lot of the operators interviewed in the study were more parcel companies or dry goods or potentially some food. So we are keen to understand more requirements for other sectors. And then from a site owner's point of view, we would like site owners to identify any underutilized space, which we, as I said, found 29 when we were doing the study. Contact CRP so that we can add it to the map and fill in this Excel sheet, which has come through the study. There's a now a huge template that goes through exactly what you would need to be thinking about if you have found underutilized space and whether that would be relevant for logistics use. And then once this is looked at and the relevant information is gathered, it will be added to the website and then any operator interest will be sent to the site owner. Please ask any questions in the meantime on the chat if there is anything. So the map and the tool has been created to make it more useful for both operators and boroughs or landowners. But we are looking to continuously add on more functionality to the map. So we will be looking at adding new types of sites. So 
potentially rapid charging sites that could be available for charging operators. We're also looking to trial some hub spaces with consolidation and distribution through a separate project with DEFRA. Um, and this is looking at logistics and seeing how these sites could physically be being used by businesses in the local area. And also connecting the stakeholders of local authorities, logistics operators, residents and regional authorities. So we are going to continue working on this map. This is a, just the start and we're hoping that this can build relationships and better ways to use underutilised space in London. And just quickly, this is potential space. So there is still a process after these sites have been identified that an operator would need to go through, such as planning permissions through a local authority. This is just to showcase the sites that could go through that process. And I think that's it from me. It's a whistle to stop tour of the tool, but um, it is now available online to view. And we're very happy to take any questions or have conversations. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, I do have a number of pre-submitted questions that the audience have already submitted. So it'd be great if you have time to answer a couple of those for us, perhaps taking a couple of minutes to talk to us on each one. Um, the first one that I've had submitted says, can you see the urban logistics hubs being suitable for the construction industry that delivers huge amounts of materials into and out of the city? Yes, we, we, we would really like to understand more about what the construction sector would look like with hubs. Um, we definitely think that with the amount of deliveries coming in and out, it's definitely useful to consolidate those and distribute them through hubs. So um, very happy to understand more of the specific requests for space from construction companies um, and so that we can add this to the map. Great. So basically anyone should get in touch with us if they're interested. Yes, yes, yes. Um, also, we've had a question about whether there is any initiative that aims to consolidate a digital live data approach in relation to logistics, air quality and other related data. So there, as far as we believe, this is probably the first digital map showcasing these kind of sites for both site owners as well as operators. Um, but we think that this will align with other tools that are out there at the moment, such as TfL have their own website for rapid charging hubs. And we would like to align that with the climate change emergencies and align all of this for an online tool that that does have the relationship between logistics, air quality and other data. But currently, as far as I'm aware, there isn't a one tool that functions for all of that at the moment. OK, so plenty for us all still to do together. Do you think there is also a role for government and possibly other organisations too to support collaboration between urban delivery companies on shared logistics hubs? Or do you think the fierce competition for hubs in London is actually going to result in large incumbents pricing out the innovators in the sector? So... With all of the consolidation ideas that we have discussed through the study, the idea is that multi operating sites would be really useful. And that's for both large operators and small operators like cargo bike companies. The, the idea is that we're minimizing the amount of traffic um, through lots of different operators. So we would expect that innovators would welcome a shared space. And um, we hope that both local authorities and landowners look to share their space rather than it being for just um, the larger operators. OK, brilliant. OK, Laura, that's really useful. Um, what I'm going to do now is introduce our next lunchtime launch speaker to make sure that we stick to time. But we will answer your questions in the chat box and we will be sending out a follow up email tomorrow to answer everyone's questions, too. Um, so, as I say, our next speaker is Dr. Rachel Aldred from University of Westminster's Active Travel Direct, Active Travel Academy. Sorry. 
Okay, great. Thanks very much, um, Susanna. And I hope um, everybody can hear me now. I'm really pleased to be here and really interesting um, presentation from Laura just now. And it's great to be focusing on um, spatial mapping and the contribution that spatial data can make. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you to my colleagues, Anna Goodman, Asilia Berlingieri, Irina Ritiver and Megan Sharkey, who worked with me on this project. Um, and secondly, just to stress that this presentation is specifically about equity mapping of low traffic neighbourhoods. It's not about the impacts of low traffic neighbourhoods themselves. So we've done other work looking at impacts on active travel, car use and ownership, fire response times, crime and injury. I think that's all of it. And you can find those um, mostly in the journal Transport Findings. And I think a link to that is going to be shared. So if you're interested in the impacts of low traffic neighbourhoods, there's other work that we've done. But obviously I could talk about that for a great length today is just about equity mapping. So just wanted to start off because I know that not everybody may be familiar with low traffic neighbourhoods. So basically what we're talking about here is um, area level schemes. So it's um, these are schemes that aren't just about one street. They're schemes that aim to reduce through motor traffic, remove through motor traffic from a neighbourhood, from mainly residential streets. So they'll be affecting sort of clusters of streets. Um, this isn't a new intervention, but it's something that's been going in at, um, at greater pace and un under COVID times as well, one of the goals was to increase the space available to pedestrians, particularly in the context of narrow footways. But of course, there's a whole range of other potential impacts as well. Um, so this mapping that I'm going to be talking about is looking at London's new low traffic neighbourhoods that have been introduced last year between March and September. So this is an analysis looking at where those low traffic neighbourhoods went in. Um, and just to give you a few headlines about these, um, they covered 4% of London residents. So that's quite a lot of low traffic neighbourhoods going in. So just over 300,000 people um, are being covered by low traffic neighbourhoods that went in in this context. The map on the left is showing you what we call modal filters. So um, bollards, planters and so on um, that have been placed um, or camera gates that have been pla placed so as to reduce or remove through motor traffic. Um, in Hackney, the figure was as high as one in six or 17%. So some boroughs built um, an awful lot. On the other hand, um, some other boroughs didn't build any at all. So basically two thirds of London boroughs built some LTNs, um, but a third didn't, or in a couple of cases, put some in, but removed them straight away. So here you can see the low traffic neighborhood areas. We had to collect this data and we had to map it ourselves because there wasn't a kind of central repository of this data. Um, one of the things that's worth pointing out is that across a range of demographic groups, around nine in 10 Londoners live on primarily residential streets. So potentially this intervention, you know, is not suitable everywhere but it could be potentially suitable for quite a lot of residential streets. So it could be something that, that, that could be used widely if it's found to be effective. Um, the other thing that we did when we were gathering the spatial data on low traffic neighbourhoods where they were in London um, was that we drew, if you see the black lines there, we drew um, basically boundary roads, roads that potentially um, might at least initially see some displacement of motor traffic. And we wanted to do this to look at, you know, who was living around those roads and to try and see if there were any differences in terms of people living in the low traffic neighbourhoods. Just another thing to highlight on this map, um, you can see that not all modal filters are associated with a low traffic neighbourhood. So we made a judgment as to whether, you know, something really was an area based scheme. If it was affecting just one street, then we didn't we we, 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 we didn't define it as a low traffic neighbourhood. I'm very happy to there's more de uh, detail in the paper and I can talk more about that or, or happy for people to contact me if you want to know more. Um, so these are our key research questions that we were looking at. Oh, and it's worth saying that Transport for London, in thinking about how low traffic neighbourhoods should be prioritised, did talk about deprivation as being one um, factor to look at, along with a range of other factors. So it's interesting, you know, to see whether in practice those neighbourhoods have been put in, low traffic neighbourhoods have been put in places that are more deprived, for instance, or not. So our first research question looks at whether um, with respect to key dimensions of equity, so um, we looked at things like ethnicity and deprivation, how equitably are LTNs distributed across London? So are they in places that are more deprived or are they in places that are relatively well off? Secondly, we looked at if there were any differences between those low traffic neighbourhoods and nearby areas in relation to those dimensions. So in other words, 
our low traffic neighbourhoods put in in little affluent enclaves, for instance, and surrounded by poorer areas or vice versa? You know, what's what's the what's that micro level picture? And thirdly, we looked at whether um, relationships across the whole of London were also present within individual districts or boroughs. So in other words, you know, you could have a picture across London that is looking pretty good in terms of deprivation. So low traffic neighbours could be put in more deprived areas, but that could be due to the fact only that Hackney has put them in and Bromley hasn't, for instance. So, you know, it might not be about individual boroughs prioritising. It might just be about what the kind of boroughs that put them in. So these are all kind of interesting questions, I think. And I'm just going to um, spend the rest of the presentation just um, saying a little bit about the methods that we used, how we did that, and then give you some findings. So this gives you a close up. This is Ealing, I think. This gives you a close up of some of the data that we're working with in terms of these low traffic neighbourhoods. So the red um, is the um, low traffic neighbourhood areas. Um, and th those little orange circles are the specific measures, the modal filters that make, that, that make up the low traffic neighbourhood where you would expect to see reduced amounts of motor traffic. Um, and the black are the boundary roads that we've defined. So potentially the roads that um, could experience traffic displacement if that happens. Then what we're doing is we're working with data, as Susanna mentioned, at output area level. So output areas are relatively small. They're a census geography and they contain a few hundred people. So this just shows you how many output areas there are within a low traffic neighbourhood. Um, so generally, we, we, we have quite a few output areas within each low traffic neighbourhood. So this allows us at quite a granular level to say what kind of people live within um, this low traffic neighbourhood. And we're using um, census data and deprivation data. Um, I can, again, there's more detail in the paper. What we're also doing in order to try and estimate how many people from each group live in a low traffic neighbourhood is we're using building area. So we're saying, OK, what proportion of each of buildings in an output area lie within a low traffic neighbourhood? So that helps to deal with the fact that, you know, roads and parks take up space. But, you know, um, people are not are not living in them. People are living in the buildings. So we, we're using that as well, the buildings data. Um, this just shows you this next slide. The pink areas are areas where um, the output area um, touches a boundary road related to the LTN. So we can look at the characteristics of people living in those output areas compared to, for instance, pe people living in the output areas um, that contain low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, and the next slide, yep, this is just this is just showing you again within this area of Ealing, um, the green areas are those output areas um, that that um, lie fully within a low traffic neighbourhood, and the pink are the areas that um, potent, that, that are touching boundary roads. So we've got we've got all this data across London, and we can calculate, you know, we're calculating then uh, the makeup of people who live in these various different areas. So um, to, to come to some results. So firstly, um, we're looking at age and we're using two measures here in relation to the low traffic neighbourhood. So the blue bars are the proportion of that group that are living within a new low traffic neighbourhood introduced in those six months of 2020. The orange are the people living within 500 metres of a new modal filter. So this could be seen as this is walking distance, pedestrian walking distance. So the, the, the orange bars are people who, you know, they don't necessarily live within that area, but they potentially have access to it. So, you know, possibly um, if you think about these new these streets that now don't really have much in the way of motor traffic, this may potentially give people access to better routes, to better, particularly better walking routes to parks and so on. So we've also used that as a measure, but the main measure we use is, is actually living within a new low traffic neighbourhood. So you can see in relation to age, it's not that much difference by age. People, working age adults are slightly more likely to live in a new low traffic neighbourhood, a bit more likely to live within 500 metres of a new modal filter, but the picture is, is, is not massively different. Um, when we look at ethnicity, um, th this, is, this is interesting. I mean, again, there are not huge differences, but if we compare, if we, if we put together um, different ethnic groups groups as black, Asian or minority ethnic and compare them to white Londoners, then basically the proportions living in a new LTN are very similar. But when we disaggregate black, Asian and minority ethnic people into three groups, black, Asian and mixed or other, you can see that the patterns are a bit different for the different groups. So you can see here that, for instance, um, black Londoners are just over just over 5% of them are living in a new LTN compared to 3.7% of white Londoners. But then the proportion is a bit lower again for Asian Londoners. It's, it's more like um, it's more like 3%. 
So there are differences between groups. And one of the things possibly that's happening here is around which boroughs are putting in low traffic neighbourhoods. Um, so the two boroughs who put low traffic neighbourhoods in and remove them soon after, so they're not in our data set, um, those were both those were in areas with relatively high Asian populations. So it's interesting to speculate how this picture might have changed if those had not been removed. We also looked at disability. So this is from um, the, the, the census disability question of whether your day to day activities are limited a little or a lot. And basically, this is telling you there's not very much difference that people, um, disabled people and non disabled people are pretty similarly likely to live inside a new low traffic neighborhood or not. Household car ownership, this, this was interesting. So um, people with no car are substantially more likely to live um, in or near a new LTN compared to people with one or more cars. So this is hopefully a you know, positive finding in terms of equity because it suggests that people without cars are benefiting more from LTNs than people with cars. And they probably you know, have, have, more need, have more need of LTNs. Um, so around 5% of people with no car living in a new LTN compared to just over 3% of people with one or more living in, of households, sorry, with one or more cars. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, as the two are correlated, we also see this kind of positively equitable picture across London in relation to deprivation. Um, so when we this, these are quarters of deprivation across London. So the, the, the quarter um, people living in the quarter of areas that are least deprived next, next, and then the quarter of areas that are most deprived. So you can see here a gradient in that people living in the richest areas, just under 2%, um, are living in a new LTN, but that changes to over 5% of people in the most deprived quartile. Just before I get on to the, the borough level findings, I wanted to say something about this. So I'm not going to go through these numbers. I'm just going to explain um, what we're doing here. So we're also here comparing people who live in areas fully inside LTN. So that's output areas that are completely inside LTN. So none of those people, you know, all of those people are living um, on streets that have motor traffic reduced due to an LTN. And we're comparing them with the makeup of people here. Um, the makeup of the population living in areas outside low traffic neighbourhoods that touch boundary roads. So this is a, not a comparison of people who benefit and disbenefit. This is more looking at the left hand column is people who are likely to benefit the most. And the right hand column is people living in areas that possibly may um, be they may be positively or they may be negatively impacted potentially you know they may have more access to quiet routes on the other hand there may be traffic displacement so it's just kind of a check to see how different those groups are and what we're finding there is basically there aren't really any major differences the populations are relatively similar and this probably isn't what that surprising really because these are very small neighboring areas but you know it certainly doesn't seem the case that the LTNs are in very leafy areas and then there's very poor areas surrounding them actually the deprivation picture are relatively similar and again there's more detail of this in the paper the last thing i wanted to talk about though just before i finish is um is the borough level picture so this takes this takes a, a, a little bit of explanation so this what this is doing this is looking at equity within a district so this is saying for instance within hackney to give one example is Hackney putting in low traffic neighbourhoods in its more deprived areas or in its less deprived areas? Is it putting them in its more ethnically diverse areas or its less ethnically diverse areas? And I think what this shows, which is really interesting, is that you know across London the picture is generally quite positive for equity, particularly if we're talking about deprivation. You know, LTNs have been put in more deprived areas um, generally, but this is really variable by borough. So um, you know, there are clearly different planning processes. There's different things happening in different boroughs. So what you've got on the horizontal axis is um, the ratio in terms of deprivation, you know, are LTNs in more or less deprived areas? And on the vertical axis, are LTNs in more or less ethnically diverse areas? So basically, the top right quadrant is places where um, LTNs are put in more deprived areas and more diverse areas, and the bottom left is the opposite. So as I'm, and, and, and the size of the circle is actually showing you how many, you know, what proportion of the borough is covered by LTNs. So there's a lot going on in this chart, um, I, I acknowledge. But um, it is it does show you that there is a lot of variation. I would point out that this only, you you know, this is only part of the story and that, for instance, in some of those boroughs on the bottom left, you know, other things may be going on. There may be reasons why they put the LTNs in places that they have. So Enfield, for instance, specifically chose to put its LTNs next to a new cycle route that had been built. Um, 
So there's different grounds for prioritising areas and it's possible the picture may change, you know, as if more low traffic neighbourhoods go in, um, you know, places that have built more, um, you know, like Hackney, um, like Lambeth, um, the picture is potentially um, a bit more more equitable. Um, so yeah, just to just to kind of um, sum up, really, we um, in the paper we conclude that overall this first wave of low traffic neighbourhoods in London was broadly equitable, equitably distributed. So um, you know, in terms of ethnicity, there wasn't that much difference, and they tended to be put in more deprived areas with lower car ownership. We also found at the micro level, you know, it looked reasonably equitable as well but that there was this big variation I was talking about in terms of um, districts. So some districts had prioritised uh, deprived areas much more than others. So clearly, you know, the fact that London's planning is district led or borough led um, does seem to have these implications. Um, and we conclude that, you know, while low traffic neighbourhoods have strong potential to improve equity of access, you know, to improve people's access to quiet streets, better pedestrian infrastructure in particular, because our other studies found that LTNs tend to have a strong impact on walking, you know, this won't automatically happen everywhere. So we think this, this equity mapping is, is really useful, potentially for allowing planners, you know, it could be used in other contexts, it's not just a London thing, to keep an eye on where stuff is going in, and which neighbourhoods are benefiting, which groups of residents are benefiting, and so on. Um, so I'll just, um, yeah, I'll just stop there and see if there's, um, if there's any questions. Great, thanks very much, Rachel. That's really interesting to see all that impartial data, given all the amount of press attention there has been on low traffic neighbourhoods recently. Um, I know one of the pre-submitted questions we had was from someone interested to hear your thoughts on whether strategies to improve air quality in dense urban retail areas might also be applicable to more spread out suburban areas of London too. I mean, it's, it's interesting in, in our research into low traffic neighbours. So a lot of our early research focused on Walton Forest because they've introduced these kind of, there are long-standing low traffic neighbours that have been introduced from around 2015, 2016. So actually quite a lot of our research on impacts of LTNs has been focused on an outer London context. And it's, it's interesting that some of the research that we're doing now um, that looks across the whole of London suggests that potentially the impacts, the beneficial impacts may be stronger in outer than in a London, but we still need more research on this. So it seems Seems like they, they they do seem to um, you, you know they do seem to be um, no less appropriate in outer area outer London compared to inner London I think. Great, and we've also had questions about how as transport and environment professionals we're actually engaging with the medical profession. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's quite positive um, for me about current debates is the extent to which transport and health are increasingly brought together. And you can see, um, for instance, that um, in, in Southwark, Guys and St Thomas's is funding and, and evaluating so they can see the impact several low traffic neighbourhoods. So they've got a strong interest in it. Um, and I think one of the other things that we found in, in some early research, I mean, I want to we want to do more research on this, including across outside of London, but the fact that we saw a strong decline in injury risk um, in low traffic neighbourhoods and that those injuries were not just displaced to main roads that they didn't that, that seemed to be a decline in in injuries um, you know that, that is something that's of interest not just to public health people but also injury medics as well yeah um, I can also see the second to last question actually in the chat box Rachel there's somebody asking a question about the photograph the visual that's up on the screen now and clarifying which actual um bicycles are allowed in low traffic neighborhoods ah oh yeah that's a, a sign that's not my sign that's um that's a sign that's that's increasingly been used to sort of highlight the extent to which um, you know, the, the, there are benefits for people using non-motorised modes. Um, so it's not kind of an, an, an official department for transport sign. Um, but yeah, I mean, e-bikes, pedelec bikes um, are fine. I mean, many, many uh, of the LTNs that have been introduced in London more recently use um, um, camera gates, which um, allow emergency vehicles through without unlocking bollards and stuff. So there's some variation, but yeah, e-bikes, I think um, pedelecs and so on would be fine. Brilliant. So some people still feel as if air quality is an underrated issue. 
Do you agree with that? Or do you think that's still a problem? Or do you think that there's enough of a policy and intervention response to the issue in London at the moment? I mean, I think we're all increasingly aware of the, the negative um, impacts of, of motor vehicle use and the need to ensure that unnecessary car trips are reduced. Um, so I think I think there is growing awareness of that and all the multiple benefits that we can have. We can reduce the amount of driving, unnecessary driving, so we can improve air quality, we can imp increase physical activity, we can reduce injuries and so on. So there is, there is greater awareness. The extent to which it's made its way into planning, I mean, there's clearly a number of things we need to do to improve air quality um, on main roads, in particular, there's a great need for extending, in my view, extending the low emission, uh, uh, you know, the the ultra low emission zone. There's need to improve, uh, for instance, bus emissions and so on. So I think there's a range of things that need to be done. But the debate, I think, is increasingly focusing on air quality and other health aspects. Brilliant. Rachel, we really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Thank you very much for your presentation and for all of those comments. Um, Laura, I wonder if I can just bring you in for a couple of minutes to make a, a final couple of observations from your side of things, taking into account some of the comments that have been coming through in the chat box. Yeah, so um, I've seen that there's been a few comments about um, plans, London plan, um, planning permissions for hubs. Um, I would say have a read of the study as we have kind of aligned it with what potentially boroughs or other stakeholders are seeing with logistics hubs. Um, as I said, it's kind of a matchmaking service to, to show that there is demand or that there is enough supply. Some of these sites were not looked at as um, logistic spaces before you know these are these are things that would normally not be thought of like that um, and some new kind of stakeholders coming in more landowners who are looking to kind of revitalize their space a bit or you know car parks not being used as, as efficiently I think there's some really innovative ideas that are coming through um, so it's 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 a constant process and with these new ideas you know hopefully that will come through as um planning changes across London, especially after the pandemic. It's a very different type of place, space is used differently, streeteries take up space on potentially streets now. So if there's a way to help both supply and demand, both at the start of the destination at the end would be brilliant. So still ongoing, but yes, the right stakeholders are being discussed with them um, planning and things like that. Brilliant, Laura, thanks very much. Um, Thank you for all of the questions and comments that you've posed in the chat box today from the audience. We'll definitely answer any that we haven't had a chance to answer verbally now in the follow up email that comes out tomorrow. Um, we'll also include all of the presentation materials and links to all of the reports that both Rachel and Laura have referred to during their presentations. Great. So um, we'd also just like to take this opportunity to quickly point out to you CRP's next lunchtime launch session, which will be on Thursday, the 24th of June, again at 1.15. And this session's topic will be all about the ultra low emission zone or the ULES expansion. So before we wrap up, I just want to remind you of everybody's contact details. Don't hesitate to get in touch with any of us with any queries or information that you have. Maybe you've got sites that you would like to be included in the new logistics web page. Um, I'd like to thank both of our speakers, Rachel and Laura, for some really thought provoking conversations and discussions. A very big thank you to everybody for tuning in today. Remember to stay safe while you're enjoying yourselves and we look forward to seeing you all again very soon. Thank you.